You often hear that the ultimate goal for each and every decision in poker should be to maximize EV. But what does this actually mean? Well, technically, the EV for taking a particular action with a particular hand is calculated by determining the number of chips won or lost against all possible hands in villain's range across all possible counter strategies and board runouts. Each of these outcomes is then multiplied by the probability the outcome will occur, and all of the products are then summed up. The end result is the EV of taking the action. However, obviously in reality, this calculation is not possible to do in game. So how does one use the concept of EV to actually shape his decision at the felt? Well, the most common approach is known as targeting, which involves a two-step process. First, you assess the primary incentives for your hand based on its strength, and then you assess the likely combos in your opponent's range that match that incentive. The more hands you can think of, the greater the EV will be for following that incentive. Targeting is effective because it allows you to specifically focus on the regions of your opponent's range that are most relevant to your hand's incentive. So for example, if you're value betting, considering the hands in villain's range that will fold to a bet is not really relevant because those folds don't impact the EV of value betting. Now the key to targeting effectively is identifying the most prominent regions of villain's range because doing this will result in your EV approximating heuristic to more closely match the actual EV of the scenario. What you don't want to do is put your opponent on one specific hand because that analysis will only capture a tiny fraction of the actual EV equation. But if you miss a few outlier combos here and there, it won't have much impact on the EV calculation because remember, one half of the equation is based on probability. To show how this targeting process works in real time, we're going to review a few hands played by cash game specialist Stefan Sontheimer, who is one of the best that I've seen at articulating complex range analysis on the fly while taking into account both game theoretic and exploitative considerations. Here I sometimes 3-bet king 9 of diamonds, I roll a call, and here with the king 9 of diamonds we can obviously check race, we can check call. I like thinking about okay what good stuff is happening, I'm folding out ace 9, I'm folding out, am I folding out king jack, king queen? I think so, offsuit, so this is good for my king. I want to check race aggressively on paired boards, so this gives it a higher frequency that good stuff is happening. So in this first hand we have Luke Johnson, also known as Clanty, opening the cutoff and Stefan defends in the big blind. The flop is 10-10-6 with two diamonds and Clanty makes a small continuous bet giving Stefan a decision. Should he check call or check raise? He decides to check raise citing a couple factors. One is that he thinks he should be check raising with high frequency on this paired board which the solver agrees with. This is primarily due to the fact that most of the preflop callers range will often whiff on these boards thereby incentivizing the preflop aggressor to bet at a high frequency with most or all of his range including some trash with decent equity that will fold to a check raise. And it is that that portion of Clanty's range that Stefan articulates that he's targeting with his specific action. Villains combos that are stronger but are likely to fold, such as Ace-9, King-Jack, and King-Queen. Note that Stefan does not hone in on one specific hand to target. He cites several hands because, as we mentioned in the intro, the more hands he can think of that are stronger but will fold, the more EV he will gain with this play. And we see that against this raise, the cutoff does in fact fold many hands that have higher showdown value than Stefan's King-9. This is a diamond, which is obviously good for both players. I have lots of diamonds in my check raising range. He continues with all the diamonds he's having. We just continue small here. This is what we can do with almost our entire range. 10 can still value bet like that. Diamonds can go like that. That would be a nice run out. So Clanty calls Stefan's raise. The turn is the three of diamonds. Stefan continues, sizing down this time, and Clanty decides to fold. Although Stefan doesn't articulate his target in this instance, it's easy to imagine where this bet derives EV from, namely one pair hands that will have a very difficult time calling again now that the flush has come in, especially since Stefan's check raising range likely consists of so many of them. As we can see, hands as strong as second pair are blue, indicating poor equity, and hands as strong as over pairs are green, indicating mediocre equity, so a small value bet targeting these sorts of hands to continue does make sense. 
One thing to note here is how the targeted region changed based on the strength of Stefan's hand. On the flop, although Stefan had good equity, he only had king high, so his target range was better hands that were likely to fold. But on the turn, now that his hand is very strong, he wants his opponent to call, so the target changes to villain's weaker made hands that can call. This highlights the efficiencies gained by using a targeted approach, as it allows Hero to focus on the select regions of villain's range that are most relevant to his hand's incentives instead of just haphazardly trying to assess villain's entire range. And here, pretty much same thing is good stuff happening. I have a backdoor straight, I have an overcard. This is a perfect candidate for a check raise. Queen 5, Queen 3 would be even better maybe. I'll give that like a 60% check raise and we go for it. It's our buddy Sunny92 here playing all the mistakes and stars these days. Pretty much playing with him every day. This here sucks. All my 5-3 and so on did not connect. My overcard is still slightly okay blocking. That connectivity here is good. Folding out 8-7. And six or something like that, I have to stick, or actually I stick to its big size in here. I'm not 100% sure. It's like, I try to make a pattern for double flush draw boards, but it somehow always is different, whether you use a smaller bet or a bigger bet. I'm not 100% sure, would need to look that up. It won't be horrible. Just knowing the combinations that, that I just talked about, what is happening with those, we will have full equity on our side, we have equity going, so it, it cannot be too bad. That's, that's pretty important for me in that spot. So here we have what appears to be the same scenario as the last hand, where Villain opened in the cutoff and Stefan called in the big blind. The flop is deuce for jack with two clubs. Villain c bets small and Stefan raises again, but this time on the non-paired board, he rolls for it. Villain calls, the turn is the ten of diamonds and Stefan barrels. So this time, since Stefan didn't make his draw on the turn, his hand remains relatively weak, and therefore his primary target continues to be stronger hands that will fold. In reaching his decision to bet, first, Stefan Stefan cites the fact that he's blocking connectivity to the board, which we assume means hands like king-queen or queen-nine, perhaps with a backdoor flush and straight draw, that villain may have floated with on the flop. In other words, Stefan's queen of clubs removes some combos from the region of villain's range that are stronger and are likely to call a reasonably sized turn bet, which slightly improves the probability that villain will fold to this bet. And although Stefan cites this fact in passing, it highlights an important nuance. The the primary targets we identified in the intro to this video represent only a part of the EV equation, the positive side. In reality, there are also combos in villain's range that contribute to the negative side of the EV equation, and the best players in the world are the ones that are able to assess both sides of this analysis, because as we mentioned at the top, the more regions of villain's range you are able to consider, the more accurate your EV analysis will be. So, for example, in this case, although the target range for any bluff is villain's stronger hands that will fold, in reality, an advanced EV analysis will also consider villain's stronger hands that will call as well, because those hands contribute to the negative side of the EV equation. The greater number of stronger hands that will call that Hero can think of, the more it reduces the EV of bluffing. So in this case, Stefan's hand blocks a portion of this region, which reduces the negative side of the EV equation for his bluffs, giving him a higher incentive to fire. And even if Villain does have a stronger hand that calls, Stefan notes that his flush draw with an over gives him good equity, which mitigates some of the negative side of the equation because sometimes he will make his flush, resulting in positive EV. And in terms of Villain's targeted folding range, Stefan hones in specifically on pocket 8s, 7s, and 6s, or in other words, mediocre pairs. If we assume Villain has many such mediocre pairs here, it would make his range mid-heavy, represented primarily by these orange and yellow colored segments, which warrants a larger bet like the one Stefan fired, given the relative brick on the turn. I see here what Luke is doing. So now, what the strategy here is that he is not way lighter, right? He's not way lighter, it's just a very different SBR than I'm used to. So he plays like, I have an uncapped range, he says like, okay, I'm playing now. He pretty much plays without fold equity. I still need to fold the correct hands, but obviously this is a clear call. I need to find the correct four bats here and I need to play, way more important, I need to play the SPR more correctly because now obviously it's instead of like 15 in the middle and having like SPR six or so, we have 11 in SPR nine. So it's like over pairs are not always the nuts, right? I can pressure him more on some boards and less on others. It's important that I'm range aware of what I'm having. Like here I'm having every pocket that I 
open raised. Apparently I told you I'm not open raising proper threes here, which is a problem here. Maybe this is kind of obvious with those short stacks that I never have that. And this is why his big sizing is actually pretty good. My ace three is a clear continuation. The ace is just such a big card and the three as well. And this will be a two street continuation very, very often. I beat or actually dominate lots of his bluffs while having five very clean outs. One problem is that his bluffs obviously have lots of equity against me as well. I had a random king jack, obviously a six outs against me. So here Stefan is up against Clanty again, this time in a 3-bet pot. Because of the unique preflop sizings used in this hand, we've run a custom sim as a starting point, and on that basis, we see that the solver does call Clanty's larger c-bet on the flop with ace 3 of diamonds. As Stefan mentioned, his targeted range for his call consists of the numerous bluffs in Clanty's range, which should be prevalent on this relatively dry board. Specifically, Stefan focuses on Broadway combos like King Jack and Ace Highs, which we see make up the largest portion of Clanty's betting range by far. He should split a little, he has offsuit hands, he should keep going with spades a lot. I'm check jamming quite a lot here, like some spades, obviously. I'm check jamming like five, six. And now we are like getting with a big size and another very big size, we are getting actually close to the normal SBR, right? River SBR will be same like in a three bed pot. Still, I paid way more to get here. So my range is, is kind of stronger. So he keeps it wide, preflop, and now he narrows it down. But still, I mean, pocket sevens are good, pocket fours are good with the additional gut shot, but my hand is better than pocket eights. The turn is a six of spades and clanty barrels with an 86% pot bet and Stefan calls again, this time identifying bluffs with spades as his primary target, and we do see that many of Villain's bluffs do in fact contain a spade. However, the solver folds Stefan's specific hand. This may be a consequence of the differences in the preflop ranges, or it may just be human error, given that it's impossible in the moment to always precisely identify the correct bluff catchers to call with in accordance with the sim. That being said, calling doesn't lose a ton of EV, and Stefan did recognize the fact that he does have better hands to call with, such as pocket sevens and fours, which have stronger outs, and some worse bluff catchers that should fold, such as pocket eights that have fewer outs. Ultimately, as long as he has some rational methodology to call with some bluff catchers and fold others, that's really the best any human can do as a practical matter. This is now not the best card. It looks like, okay, I'm protected, I have lots of 4x, I might have 4-5, I might have pocket 4s, but it's important that I know my range, that I don't have that. <laughs> now it's interesting, what is his jamming range? Does he figure that out himself, that he can still easily value jam pocket jacks and queens here? easily for stacks. Some people might be scared. If that is not the case, well then it's like king's aces and then my hand gets more and more of a better catcher. Yeah, his bluffs are like random high, high cards like king queen, king jack, queen jack. He shouldn't actually bet ace four too often on the turn with the risk of me check jamming. This is like a zero EB catcher if you look it up like anywhere. I'm just thinking about how good is it. I don't think that he is really bluffing lots of ace highs, like no ace king that has showdown value against my ace jack, ace queen of spades. So actually having the ace blocks aces but not many bluffs. Not having a king, not having a queen, not having a jack is uh, good. That's his bluffs. And now it's like kind of the thing, like do I run a randomizer if he jams? We played a lot this morning already and he had it in every single spot. So I don't know whether that plays a role. He always tanks for like 50 seconds each decision, which kind of annoys me. And now it's like everything we have is just the same hand. Pocket seven, six, seven, and I think this is one of the better hands. So I will give that some calling, some calling frequency. Let's first look at the number and then make the decision. If it's like a 70, we have an easy fold. If it's like a 25 and lower, we have an easy call in between we make a decision 83 is unfortunately an easy fold the river is a deuce of diamonds clanty shoves and stefan ends up folding after randomizing ultimately stefan concludes that his hand is basically a zero ev bluff catcher which could go either way by focusing on two regions of clanty's range value bets and bluffs first he assesses the primary value portion of clanty's range which quite clearly are over pairs and notes that the likely composition of over pairs that shove depends on stefan's defending range Range. Now in last week's video, we said that it is much more important to have an idea of your opponent's perception of your range than to know your own actual range, which seemed to have caused some confusion that I'd like to clarify, especially given that here, Stefan himself says that it's important that he knows his own range. The general game theoretic principle of ensuring that you have sufficient bluffs when you have value bets is obviously something that I am well aware of, as 
I've made multiple videos covering this topic. However, the point in the last video was that this sort of balancing is only important to the extent your opponent has the ability to identify when you become unbalanced, and Clanty is certainly one of those opponents. In the past, we've seen Stefan say that he completely throws balance out the window against recreationals. But against this specific opponent, it is important that Stefan is, as he puts it, range aware so that he can fire sufficient bluffs to induce Clanty to bluff catch his value bets. That all being said, even in this situation, notice that in Stefan's actual analysis, his primary focus was, in fact, on Clanty's perception of his range. Specifically, Stefan identifies two possible scenarios. The first scenario is where Clanty recognizes that Stefan doesn't have much 4x in his range, which would cause the equity of shoving hands like pocket jacks and queens to go up. On the other hand, if Clanty believes that Stefan has a significant amount of 4x in his range, then it would diminish the strength of pocket jacks and queens, making the primary combos in Clanty's value range likely to be pocket kings and aces, which Stefan's hand is a good bluff catcher against, since his ace of diamonds would proportionally block a significant portion of that value range. And on the bluff side, Stefan articulates that his primary targets are hands like king queen, king jack, and queen jack. He doesn't think Clanty would bluff with many ace highs, which if if true would make Stefan's hand a great bluff catching candidate because it would unblock virtually all of Clanty's bluffs. And although the solver doesn't have Stefan's specific hand on the river because it folded all ace three of diamond combos on the turn, we do see that ace three and ace deuce of spades are in fact zero EV bluff catchers, which sometimes call and sometimes fold. Oh, eights here, often the three bet, sometimes a call. Check, check, check on ace 10 four, interesting. We try to check down. King is obviously very, very, very bad. He has lots of king highs that he checks all the way. We can only hope for a give up that turns seven or maybe four. Yeah, here we go. So in this hand, Villain opens the small blind as Stefan calls in the big blind with pocket eights. It gets checked down to the river, which is the king of clubs, and Villain checks again. Stefan notes that this card is bad for his range, as Villain is likely to have many king highs that could have taken this line on the ace high flop but Stefan checks back nevertheless. So what is his target here? It's the weaker hands in Villain's range that have some showdown value. In this case, Stefan articulates that there is a decent probability that Villain has a four or a seven, which turns out to be correct. The more hands that Stefan can think of in this target region, the more EV his check back will accrue, and blind versus blind, Villain is likely to have sufficient hands behind Stefan's eights to give him decent EV in this line. As we can see, this class of weak pairs, putting aside pocket eights and nines, is the most prominent one in Villain's river range. And bottom right, pocket jacks going for the easy three bet. Ace, queen, nine. I can easily still bet very high frequency. I could play with checking range as well. I'm actually betting 10% pot here. Pocket jacks, a very clear check. And pocket jacks now, check, check. Definitely a check, hoping to win against king 10, hoping to win against the nine. Question is just how often am I check jamming, blocking king jack suited. So here we have tens. Here we have queens and aces. I play the same way. 85 is not a jam, unfortunately. So the cutoff opens and Stefan three bets from the small blind with pocket jacks. Villain calls and the flop is ace, queen, nine. And Stefan decides to continue with a tiny 10% pot bet, indicating that this is likely a range bet on this favorable board where much of Villain's range is crushed. Villain calls, the turn is a three of hearts and Stefan checks with his mid pair. Villain checks back and the river is a 10 of hearts and Stefan decides to check again. Similar to the last hand, since Stefan is taking a passive checkdown line, his target will be weaker hands in Villain's range that can showdown, and Stefan specifically cites middling pairs like King-10 or 9x. But Villain doesn't check, and he bets around two-thirds pot, and Stefan decides to fold, recognizing that he has better hands in his range that could have played this way, such as 10s, queens, and aces. He also considers jamming with his marginal hand that double blocks the nuts, which we see that the solver does do with some frequency, but it prefers to do it with combos that don't contain the diamond, which blocks busted flush draws. Ultimately, Stefan rolls for it and ends up not jamming, but if he were to shove, his primary target would likely be top and two pairs, which are heavily represented in Villain's range given this bet. Again, a small blind flat, lots of guessing game what his range is. It could contain deuces and threes, it could not, and this here is bad, bad. It feels thin, actually. Should raise his sets. I don't know this guy. Can have all kinds of flushes, obviously. I think it's actually kind of thin. No clue how he's playing. Call is hopefully good. Three is that's like. Ugh. We are running bad. We are running bad this hour. I cannot show the hand history somehow anymore. 
but I see bad button versus small bind half pot on 7 deuce 3. Okay, you can slow play your set there. Good high cards coming. Turn is a 10 with a flush draw. I, I turn infinite outs and well, this time I had a top pair and I go 75%. This is the time where his threes are just the most mandatory race ever. And then I river the jack and the flush gets there. It's like, yes. How much value do I have? Feels so nitty to just check back. But in theory, if you fast plays correctly and plays fast plays some of his draws, I think it shouldn't be beat too often actually. Maybe you're a little results biased, but the feeling is there. Same like the Queen 10 of Hearts here. So here Stefan opens the button with Jack 10 of Spades and Villain flat in the small blind. The flop is 3 deuce 7 rainbow as Stefan decides to bet half pot with his two overs and the backdoor flush draw. And in these scenarios you will often see a medium bet like this because much of Hero's betting range is sandwiched between two distinct regions of Villain's range. One region that is likely behind most of Hero's betting range represented by combos with decent but not great equity like over cards or small pairs. This class of hands is not likely to fold versus a small bet. And the second region are villain's nutted hands which most of hero's betting range is behind. Given that the small blind's flatting range should be quite tight, it's likely that villain has an advantage in this area. Villain calls, the turn is a 10 of hearts, giving Stefan top pair, and although we miss the action it appears that Stefan fires again, this time with a 3 quarters pot bet, and villain calls again. The river is the jack of hearts, villain checks, and Stefan has a decision. Should he check back, or should he try to get 3 streets of value with his river? to pair. Stefan ultimately decides to try to squeak out a bit more value, citing the fact that although it's quite possible Villain has a flush, it's unlikely he has a set since most sets should have raised at some point, which the solver agrees with. However, one thing that we didn't hear Stefan mention is the portion of Villain's range that he was targeting with his bet. According to the solver, Villain should have some top and second pairs that could potentially call, but Stefan's two pair blocks many of these combos. This explains why even though the solver doesn't fire with two pair, it does fire with aces and kings with a heart because these hands are unblocking some potential calls in the small blinds range. So in order for Stefan's river bet to be profitable, presumably he would need to be called by third and lower pairs that probably also have a heart, and it's hard to imagine many of these combos calling a triple barrel in this spot, especially given the fact that Stefan could have plenty of flushes, straights, sets, two pairs, and over pairs in his range. So why did Stefan make this bet? Well, we can't read Stefan's mind, but one thing he did mention was that checking back just seemed too nitty. In light of that, we can infer that his decision may have been based at least in part on intuition, which can be a powerful thing, especially if you have as much experience as Stefan does. However, if you don't have that same level of experience, one of the benefits of targeting is that it forces you to play with intention by going through a deliberate process of considering specific combos and villains' range. It's impossible to evaluate all of the possible hands villain can have at any given moment, so targeting provides a structure to focus your attention on the regions of the range that most greatly impact the EV for your particular hand. So that's the video for today, thanks for watching and until next time. Peace.